Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Hello, uh, my name is Max Davey. I'm a community paediatrician working mainly in developmental paediatrics near the ACAM offices here in Lambeth, and I'm doing a talk for ACAM today about neurodevelopmental assessment. I'm really just going to cover the basis, basics because, well, frankly, this is my entire job, so I can't, I can't really cover much, everything I do in an hour, uh, but I will do my best. Um, this is the second of two talks that I've recorded this morning, the first being on child development and giving you the foundations of child development and how it actually happens. And I think it's probably helpful, if you don't have a grounding in child development, to go back and, and, and look at that one first. But nonetheless, let's start. Um, what I'm going to do in the next hour or so is to talk about the purpose and scope of neurodevelopmental assessment, why we do it. And then um, its structure, what, it's, what it is, uh, how it's structured, what the information is and how we put it together and also what its relationship is to diagnosis. Um, I want to make, put a sort of put a flag in immediately that this is not necessarily going to teach you how to make diagnoses. Um, which would be ridiculous in an hour. Um, but then I will take you through a sort of scheme of history taking, observation, information gathering, and some thoughts about formal tools. A lot of this is obviously going to be based on science and evidence, but also a lot of it is to do with my own experience. I've run a developmental service, particularly for over five children in Lambeth for over 10 years, and I've just worked out what works for me, but also for my team. Um, and so I think I can probably give you some uh, practical and experience-based tips on how best to do a neurodevelopmental assessment in a way that is accurate, free of bias and as efficient as possible. So what is a neurodevelopmental assessment? Well, to an extent it's two things. One is it's a clinical assessment. Um, so we see it as a assessment where you sit down with a doctor in, our, in our, our service, it would be all doctors, but actually anyone could do a developmental assessment in a slightly different way. But also the assessment, that single assessment is part of an overall pathway, which is aimed at defining the developmental profile of the child. So it may be that you will do a developmental assessment and then someone else will see them and then you'll put your information together and then you'll get a picture because what we're looking at is a profile. We're looking at what the strengths and difficulties of the child from a developmental point of view are, but not in isolation, it needs to be placed in a psychosocial context. So for instance, a child who comes from a, fa a family where there's a lot of vulnerability, of poverty, domestic violence, where there's difficulties with themselves, with the family, with mental health difficulties, that is important partly in explaining some of the developmental profile, but also more importantly, in refining and directing the support that this child and family are going to need. Because ultimately, and I'll come back to this at the end, the point of neurodevelopmental assessment is to help. Um, it's not to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. So in order to get that psychosocial context, you need to be holistic in the sense of understanding uh, all aspects of the child, but you also need to be holistic in the sense that you must um, ask about, at least to an extent, all the different aspects of the child's development. So the child's communication, the child's behaviour, because they're all interlinked, and the motor skills all related to each other. If you just do an assessment for a particular condition or a particular aspect, you will miss these interrelationships and you're likely to either over or under diagnose. So I would say, just briefly, the, 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 that an assessment of this kind may lead to a diagnosis, but that's not the purpose of the assessment. And finally, as a physical, someone with a physical health background, I want to emphasise that it is important to have some attention paid to the child's physical health as part of their developmental assessment. However you want to define that, um, I think it is, it is vital to have at least some thought about it. And so what are the aspects that we're looking at? We're looking at cognition, often not directly in terms of questioning, but maybe in terms of finding out 
um, what the uh, academic levels of the child are from school, uh, but also from some direct assessment that I'll talk about later. We talk a lot about language and communication, that would be something that we'll talk about in a minute. We'll also have a look at the child's social interaction. We'll look, it's very important, particularly if you have older children, to think about behavioural inhibition and motor and self-care skills are also uh, a, a vital part and interrelated to everything else as well. Also, um, and finally, this is something you might not find in textbooks, but I have a section of my assessment where I talk about the child's flexibility, their anxiety and their sensory needs, because those seem to group together and be um, uh, difficulties for the same group of children. Now, if you've seen my other lecture, as a talk rather, I have a different set of um, uh, subheadings because that's for understanding the process of behaviour. This is for what you ask about in clinic. Um, so they are two diff they, they are two lists for two different purposes. So why are we doing this? Why do we bother with assessing neurodevelopment? We have to remember that the child and family will come with certain difficulties. They don't come with, I think I might have ADHD. They come with, my child can't behave in school. Or, my child, you know, uh, get, loses their temper all the time and throws stuff around. That's the thing that they come with and we must never forget the thing they come with because that's the thing they need help with. So putting them in a developmental context can help to understand the behaviours. But this is important. Almost never does a developmental assessment directly explain a behaviour. It will always be in the context. So a child who has ADHD, for instance, might, um, you know, become throw things around, but the ADHD doesn't explain why they throw things around, except in the context of also being angry and frustrated and isolated and feeling like they have no other way of expressing themselves. Then the ADHD kicks in and then they throw stuff. So understanding the child's development, particularly when it's put in context, allows people to understand the child. And if you understand somebody, you can treat them in a more positive way. And that's one of the really key elements of assessment is to, to get people to really see the child as somebody with needs and to see their context and understand why it is that they behave the way that they do. But ultimately it's about refining support. The evidence is that if you make a diagnosis um, or you know you do these brilliant assessments but the support doesn't go into play go in place, it doesn't actually help. So for instance if you're trying to trying to reduce exclusions from school, it's actually not the diagnosis that helps, it's the support put in place in the community by which I mean schools, families, youth services, the police, wherever. There needs to be an understanding of these people and, and, and support, otherwise we're wasting our time. So actually if you're running or you're involved in neurodevelopmental assessment, very quickly you see that actually we have a responsibility to ensure support in the community and to advocate for support, support in the community. And that becomes very, very important, um, I think, uh, as a broader responsibility. But yes, of course, if you do make a diagnosis, you may have some diagnosis-driven management using the guidelines you have, and you may do some. But I want to emphasize that that is something that's down the line. A lot of the stuff higher up in the list is actually more important, particularly in the short term. Anyone could get a neurodevelopmental assessment, but we live and uh, work in a system where there is limited resources, and even, service you know even systems with more resources some people don't have uh, the resources to access assessment and i think it's important that we don't necessarily have to assess everybody um it probably isn't helpful the sorts of symptoms we're looking for the sorts of difficulties we're looking for i would say are three things you can need to look at one is that they're pervasive so pervasive means that they exist in across different settings if you have a child who's perfectly behaved at school but very badly behaved at home that is not a pervasive difficulty now it may be that they have a developmental problem that manifests itself in different ways in the different settings that is pervasive so it's it's the, the, the it's the fact that their difficulties are pervasive and that they are somehow related across the two um, settings so it can be nuanced but broadly speaking if there's only a problem in one place that's probably not neurodevelopmental they need to be long-standing. Now, the kind of criteria for different conditions tie themselves up a little bit in knots about when it has to start at 7, it has to start at 12. I'm not sure that's a really, something that is a terribly important debate. The important thing is that, is this, does this look like something that's always kind of been there? Has this child always kind of been a bit like this? Even if it didn't cause problems 
early in life. Have they always been a little bit like this and now it's causing problems? That's the sort of thing, the question you need to think about when you're assessing somebody as to whether that this might be a developmental problem rather than a problem that's emerged over time as a result of, kind of emerging mental health problems or uh, environmental uh, triggers. And of course, it needs to be functionally impairing. You can have the most lively or the most quirky or the most anything child, a child with, you know, whatever difficulties, but if it's not actually making a difference in their life, we're only um, satisfying our own curiosity and our own academic kind of um, egos if we're endlessly assessing them. It needs to be something that's actually affecting the child's life, otherwise we're wasting our time. So when I go through this, those of you who work in CAMS or have kind of have placements in CAMS will think, well, actually, this is quite a lot like a CAMS assessment. And I completely agree. They are broadly structurally similar. Um, and actually, in a lot of the psychosocial aspects, very similar indeed. Probably a little bit less in depth than a, than a CAMS assessment, partly because what I'm presenting is not a gold standard tertiary centre, you know, extremely expensive assessment. It's something that I do on my own in an hour and a quarter. But there is different content and emphasis uh, for a developmental assessment. So if you know CAMS assessments well, you probably very easily slot into doing developmental assessments um, quite quickly uh, just by tweaking a few of the things you're actually asking about. So you're in a very good position. So what is the structure? So there's two ways of thinking of the structure. One is as what you do in what order, but also the inf informational structure. What you're trying to do is get to a point of getting a kind of objective view of what the child's developmental profile is. And by doing that, you need to triangulate several different points of view. Each point of view is subjective, and by, to, so to get to the truth, you need to kind of look at, look at this from di different angles, in a sense. And this is why I've put up an image of uh, surveyors triangulating, because what you need to do if you're mapping somewhere is look at it from different an angles and look at the, different, the, the differences between your different, the different um, points of view. So the history from parents is absolutely vital, but is their own point of view. And that's not to say the parents are lying or manipulating. It is their story and they're telling it and that's fine. Your own direct assessment is also your own story, your own observ observation. You have your own biases. And also the child may not be displaying the behaviours because they're in front of a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist and they'll be behave very differently then. And also you will be doing some assessment, which I can talk about. And the third thing is information gathering. If it's absolutely vital that people who see this child every day, mainly thinking in over, five, over fives about um, teachers, but in under fives you have nursery workers, their point of view is really vital because they're both professional, they see a lot of children and they're objective, but also they know the child very well. So it's absolutely vital that we have their point of view involved in the assessment. So this is our clinic. Now, we, our clinic is for age five plus. There's not much difference if you're doing an under five in how you assess. You may use different um, instruments, you may set them different tasks, but broadly, um, the, 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 the big difference is the order. So we will have a parent and child present, although there will be opportunities to talk individually if that's necessary. Um, obviously, with an under five, you'll have the, the parent and child present throughout because the child wouldn't necessarily want to be parted. I will have an initial chat, and that's very important to put the child at the, the heart of the assessment and make them feel important, because it can be quite you know, daunting, really. Um, and then I tend to do the direct assessment at the beginning, so then I have an idea of what the child's capabilities are, and then when I do the assessment, when I take the history, I'm like, well, okay, he's not doing this thing that we would expect for a nine-year-old, but then I've just assessed him as having cognitive skills of a six-year-old, so I adjust my expectations. Um, while they're doing the direct assessment, the parent will fill in a form. The form is a very good and non-invasive way of them marking if there's any difficulties, or mental health difficulties or their own history, um, in a way that isn't exposing and doesn't, doesn't require them to, to talk about sensitive things that they're not comfortable talking about. And then I will take a fairly long history, guided by what I have already. I'll have a referral form, I will have the uh, initial chat with the child and then my assessment, and then, gu and then guide that through taking a history from the family, keeping the child in the room because actually one of the things I'm really interested in is what children, how children react to being talked about, how they react to being a bit bored, there's not much to do in my clinic room deliberately, um, and how basically how they respond to this situation I think is a very fascinating uh, bit of data, so you might as well gather it. We usually do a physical examination of some kind and I'll talk about why that's important and what 
you know, what you can do about that, and then we'll feedback and make a plan. So the point is, we're not giving a diagnosis, almost never giving a diagnosis at the first path after that initial assessment. I put this image up because actually in a way what you're looking for is patterns. You're looking for bits of information, but then what are the patterns that join them? So obviously you will all see a triangle in that image, but there isn't a triangle in that image. There's just three Pac-Men. Um, and it, it's almost a similar thing you're trying to do cognitively. You're trying to work out all these kind of bits of information and see what's in between them. What is the big picture here? What is the type of brain? So I'll come back to that later, this idea of what type of brain is in front of you. Um, and I'm not giving, I'm not sort of taking a sort of biological, hardcore biological kind of stance on that, but just what is the cognitive style, strengths and difficulties of this person in front of you and how can we help them with that? That's the, the question in front, that it's in front of us. So what about diagnosis? I've, di I've downgraded it, but I still use it. I think, you, that you st I, I would argue it's still valuable, but I would argue that you need to do that holistic overall assessment first and then build diagnostic assessment upon that. If you do diagnostic assessment and you haven't done a holistic assessment, you will get your diagnosis wrong. You will miss out on opportunities to support the, broader, the child more broadly. And often, of course, diagnosis does require specific assessment or specific questionnaires. Often that's local practice, but actually, if you look at the diagnostic criteria and you look at the guidance that's, that's from NICE in the UK, for instance, there's nothing absolutely specific that needs to be done, but the point is that there needs to be quite um, some investigation of the specific symptoms and specific criteria for those conditions. And absolutely, that, that a lot of these assessment tools do that very efficiently. But you need to be careful. You need to be careful that we're not trying to make ourselves feel clever by making diagnoses. We're not trying to um, feed some kind of perverse incentive so the child might get extra support if they get a diagnosis, or they might, or the family might feel exonerated and not responsible for the child's behaviour if they get a diagnosis. So, but um, and equally, there may be reasons not to give a diagnosis which are not valid. So you're sort of um, you're, you've got a real investment in in having a particular view of things and you don't want to make a diagnosis, but actually, if they have, to, if they have it, they have it. So there's lots of bias going on, there's potentially, we just not to be very aware that we, as professionals, are exactly as prone to cognitive bias as the general public. There's very good evidence for that. We are humans like anyone else, like the people in front of us, and so we just need to check our cognitive bias and build systems around ourselves that reduce our, our tendency to cognitive bias, which I think is why we have these standardised things and why I think it's important to have a broad look before we narrow it down. So, that all said, uh, what do you have to ask, ask about when you're asking? I tend to start, I've, I'm going to put the chat uh, with the child at the, uh, later on because I think I want to get, structure it for you so that you understand kind of the logic of it. So we start with the background. What, where does this child come from? I ask about the parent's history, I ask them to fill in a form about it, and I'm very interested in that because I think that not only is it the, the, where the parent was born, in work in London, lots of our parents are born elsewhere and have a history of migration, which is important, but also the parent's own history of employment, that, what the parent did in school, how they got on, because that not only is genetically important, if someone's got learning to difficulties than their child may have, but also the attitude of the parent to the, to the education system is really important in conditioning how they respond when the child starts running into problems. Or when the, you know, younger children, their willingness to, take, to send them to nursery. Um, so I think that is really, really important. Over and above that, there's a broader genetic question about, well, where does the child come from? So a lot of the families we work with, um, one or more of the biological parents is not with the child. And so actually it's the parents, the parents history of the, the, the history of the people who are looking after the child is important, but so is the history of the people who are biologically related to the child, but that's different. So often I don't pry into an absent father, but I'm just say, well, okay, we just need to know about this person from a genetic point of view. Do they have a family, a history in their family of X and Y? I don't really need to pry into personal things. I just need to know what's the genetics here. And so that makes things a bit easier. You need to think about the current household and by what by that I mean who lives with the child. It may be aunties, it may be grannies, it may be mum's boyfriend, it doesn't matter. Just 
form a history, form a picture of who's there and how they support the child. Of course, we need to talk about vulnerabilities, both past and present. So when you're thinking about the parent's history, if there's been a history of domestic violence, that's not unimportant because if that's happened at the time of a crucial time in the child's development, then that will have had an impact. And so sensitively asking about that can be really, really helpful. And I'll think about that a bit later. But it's also important to celebrate the strengths to, if you have uh, a mother who's grown up, um, you know, as a, as a young mother who's, who's been a victim of domestic violence, had mental health problems, and they had this child who's very difficult, they can feel very blamed. And I think it's really important. And when we're assessing children to, to almost say, well, wow, haven't you done well? You've got this brilliant kind of uh, broader support network. You've got him into school. He's got, this great, he's got this great school that's really helping him. And you're doing this and you're doing that. So thinking about the family's strengths as well as their vulnerabilities is really important when you're thinking about the background. And then let's move on to the child themselves. Thinking about pregnancy is very important. I've covered the different things that can affect the child in pregnancy um, in my previous lecture, but broadly, did it go well? And it's important to find out a little bit about whether there were any drugs or alcohol consumed, if you can do that in a sensitive way. Birth is important in terms of any trauma, but then just medical history generally, both in terms of whether there may have been a direct effect, but also children who are unwell just don't get the developmental input that other children would get. Um, I've put in immunizations here, not because it's particularly relevant, but it's always worth, if you're seeing a child, to check whether they've got their immunizations so they don't get measles or something else horrible, and you can have a chat about them. So that, I apologise, that's maybe a little bit indulgent of me as a paediatrician, but it's really important. Um, but more is important is we mustn't miss children who have hearing and vision deficits. A child may be behaving terribly badly um, in a classroom and nobody has realised that they are deaf, um, and maybe lots of reasons why they, but we must why they're behaving badly. But we must pick up um, hearing deficits or vision deficits. It's very easy to pick up. Screening is widely available, um, and there's just no excuse for not at least thinking about it. So then we take a developmental history. Now these can be very daunting um, because you have oh what milestones. When? When did the child do this? When did the child do that? Did they do two words at three or four words at five? And how many steps did they, how many feet were they using up and downstairs? None of that really matters, honestly, particularly if you're using, if you're looking at slightly older children. The point is to go through the child and what were they like at different ages and have a little bit of an idea of what progress they were making. But the main thing is what, you know, what kind of, what their personality were like and how they behaved. So as babies and what kind of temperament were they? Were they easy or difficult? Early, difficult, and that's actually kind of, uh, that is a scientific phrase, although it's also used as a late term, but difficult temperaments are associated with later neurodevelopmental problems, so it's important to know. And that will often be shown by difficulty with feeding and sleeping, which after all are the main functions of a baby. Um, as a toddler, you have to think about play. Did they play socially? Did they play mechanically? Um, what, you know, what were they interested in? Um, did they like um, uh, dressing up, play, so, you know, pretend? Um, and if they did like pretend, are other, were other people allowed to pretend with them? That's often a really interesting one. Where, and they, moving a little bit more into the milestones end of things, you know, were they speaking? When do they start talking? Most people, most parents can remember roughly when they started talking, when they started walking. Beyond that, it's much more useful to say, well, okay, when they got to play school, uh, you know, when was that? Oh, three. Okay, wh what were they doing at that point? When they got to play school, do you remember how much they were talking? Oh, and, you know, they were talking loads. They were kind of telling me all about it. Or, no, they still had only one word. That's the sort of thing that people remember. Um, but, then, but within that, when they start to move out of the so the family um, into the bright wider world. It's really important to ask about their sociability. Did they make friends? Were they interested? Did they want to play with other children or were they sort of off in the corner playing with the water table? And then you go off to, to preschool um, and then you develop that sort of history. Um, are they sharing? Um, are they aggressive? Do they have friends? Again, friendship starts to develop about three and become very important. And so are they able to negotiate these social relationships, which are very different to family relationships and much more conditional on the child's behaviour? And then, you know, you start to get early indicators of hyperactivity. And the classic question, of course, is 
when the child, when the children all sit down to have circle time in the preschool, is he the one who is not sitting down or won't sit down? So that's a really important uh, you know, aspect. But of course, parents may not have been told. So a lot, increasingly, as the child spends more and more time away from the family and in preschool or primary school, then it becomes much more about what the, the schools say to the parents than necessarily what's happening at home. Because the thing about schools is, they have 30 children of the same age, and if this child stands out, that's a really interesting indicator. Families often will kind of mould themselves and adapt themselves to the child in a way that's really appropriate and really great, but not helpful for you when you're trying to find out whether the child's got a neurodevelopmental problem because they don't appear often to have any kind of functional difficulties. The classic example is a child who the, the, the parent exists, perfectly understands all language, and is perfectly able to express themselves, and yet when you assess them, have you know, language skills on the point one centile. And you think, well, are the, is the parent pulling my leg? No, they have just adapted their communication style to the child and their expectations to the child, who after all, they have spent all their lives with. And so you sort of, you almost can't see the wood for the trees after a while because you have adapted so, so profoundly. If you wanted, so if you have a child and you think, oh, I just want to find out if there's some neurodevelopmental going on here, or you've got a child who's been referred and the family aren't really sure that they have any problems, this is a really quick, super quick screen that I use almost all the time. Um, particularly when I know I have to dig into one area and I'm seeing if I need to spend my time digging into other areas because none of us have got infinite time to go through all of these things infinitely. So, just a normal day, a normal Monday, going through that is a really useful, super quick screen. So, what's it like getting ready for school, you know, dressing, remembering to brush your teeth? What's it like physically getting them to school? So, are, do they drive, are they on the bus? Uh, are they walking on the road, leaping about and leaping in front, you know, what are their road safety like? How does that process go? And then imagine that they pick them up um, and then uh, incidentally I often ask, you know, have they forgotten all of their coats and hats and their bag? Do they need to go back all up? So again, that's about sort of tension. And what's it like going to the supermarket? Um, I, at some point we'll have to kind of produce a rating scale of the, ch the parent's facial expression when you mention going to the supermarket. Because I think actually that aghast expression, or that's just sort of sh shaking your head and saying, oh, I just don't do it, um, is a reasonable, <laughs> reasonable indicator that the child has some kind of behavioral difficulty or um, uh, possibly a neurodevelopmental difficulty. So what happens in the supermarket is already very, also very important. Do they run off? How's the queuing? Um, and generally, can they cope? Do they get really agitated? And then meal times also very important. What happens? Is the child chatting? Um, does the child sit still? Is the child able to use cutlery? So all of these things bring together in this very mundane question. All of these developmental skills come together. And then of course there's bedtime. Bedtime is very difficult for children with neurodevelopmental problems for lots of reasons, and there's large amounts of uh, sleep difficulty in these children. But unpacking that can be quite helpful. So is it that the child? just won't go to sleep and refuses to go to sleep and is angry, in which case you think about, well, are they scared? Are they, you know, are there sort of um, difficulties with sort of um, their attachment style, meaning that they have to be kind of in with everyone else? Um, or alternatively, is it just that they sw simply can't switch their brain off, as is often the case in neurodevelopmental conditions? So also unpacking how the family manage that bedtime, it can be really fascinating. So I say it's a super quick screen, sometimes it can take you quite a long time to get through this, but it tells you where you need to dig because you haven't got time, almost, unless you're working in one of these flash tertiary centres, to, um, uh, to dig everywhere. So then we talk about current ability. So again, I've said, as I've said, dig into this if you think it's a problem. If the evidence you've got so far tells you that this is probably a problem, if the school think it's a problem or the nursery. So first of all, understanding. This is both understanding of language. Now again, I wouldn't worry too much about um, milestones. Does he understand three key words or four key words? Because people don't remember that. It's can he understand you and or she understand you? Can they, do you have to adapt yourself to make your, make your sentences shorter? Do you have to make things very clear to them? Do you have to repeat yourself? Um, and often families will go, yes, but he doesn't listen. And you have to go, no, I'm not asking whether he does what he's told. What I'm asking is, does he understand what you're saying? And you have to really clarify that. And the second bit that you have to clarify is, 
Okay, you might understand formal language, but particularly if you have autistic spectrum problems, um, you may find informal language difficult. Difficult. So jokes, any kind of ambiguity or idiom. So wrong end of the stick is a nice one phrase to use because they're both it's both an idiom and also they are getting the wrong end of the stick. Um, just to just to kind of see what it is that they do and don't understand about language. And then of course there's expression. So it's whether they express themselves clearly. Um, it's very difficult to get parents to give you a history of you know, how many sentences and how many, you know, what, whether they're able to use the past tense effectively. Um, but they give you an idea of whether they can express themselves properly. And often the most useful things to ask about is whether they're able to explain things. Again, something that's difficult in the autistic spectrum because people on the, on the autistic spectrum often find it difficult to know what it is the other person doesn't know. Um, or being asked to um, uh, describe things, describe an event where, which is distant from, from, from the actual conversation that's going on. But also not only is it what they're saying, but how they're saying it. Is it animated? Is it associated with um, a kind of monotone speech? Or is it uh, kind of lots of different modulation? And also is it repetitive? Are they talking about the same things over and over again? And this brings me on to conversation. Conversation in a way, the ability to conduct a conversation for me is the most important differentiator between somebody with a language disorder and somebody with an autistic spectrum disorder. Someone with a language disorder may struggle to, to express themselves, but the, the basic elements of conversation, that is listening to what somebody else has to say and building on it, saying something yourself, and then they build on it, and then it goes on like that. That is intact in, in language disorder. It's just that what's said is, is often quite basic and needs to be quite basic. In autistic spectrum disorder, it's that basic ability to understand what the other person is intending in the, in, in, in the, in the conversation and build on that accordingly. That is a very, very central difficulty. And so I talk a lot about what conversation is like. Does it feel like um, the, the, the person is interested in conversation? Does it feel like the, um, the other person uh, wants an audience or a conversational partner. So often, the, particularly the more able and, and, and verbal uh, kids on the spectrum um, will kind of hold forth and not really understand when people have stopped being interested about whatever interest it is that they have. And all of this is underpinned by um, non-verbal communication. So the presence or absence, well, sorry, the use of eye contact, so it's not really the presence or absence of eye contact, um, it's whether the child is using eye contact as a tool to make or break social contact, um, whether they're using gesture, and whether, one of the things I like to ask about is whether you can tell how they're feeling from their facial expression. I think that's really a useful question. And also whether they can tell how other people are feeling from their facial expression. So then we move on to social abilities. Um, and I, I, I tend to ask about these in different kind of arenas, but essentially what we're asking about is whether the, person, whether the child is able to form relationships, whether they have social interest in other people. So sometimes if you think about um, wider family, it's really interesting to ask, well, do they ask after people? If they haven't seen their uncle for a while, do they ask after them? So it's whether they see their, their relationships as important in themselves or if they are means to an end. So just to go through quickly, what's their relationship with siblings is very important. So I, one of the things I love doing is, is asking the children how annoying out of 10 their siblings are. That's partly just to see if they find it funny because that's inter interesting to me. But also, if they score them very highly and the record is a million out of 10, um, what is it that annoys them about their sibling, but more importantly, what is it about them that annoys their sibling? And often, children with poor social understanding are completely flummoxed by this question. So sibling relationships are very important, partly because of the annoyance, of a mutual annoyance, which of course is a normal part of sibling, right, sibling relationships, but also what happens when the other child is hurt, what empathy is displayed. Now it's really important that it's absolutely fine, it's absolutely possible for a child to be highly empathic but not know how to show it. And so it doesn't mean the child doesn't have empathy, it's that they're not able to display it and communicate it, and that's an important distinction. With parents, this can be quite an awkward conversation, but it's actually knowing what, what the child's relationship with the parent is, how affectionate are they, whether they talk to the parent about problems, whether they come to them for comfort, is a really important for how they see the parent. Now, 
Obviously, this isn't just about the child's developmental status. If there's problems with the relationship, that, that will colour it. But you'll know from other things that the parent has said whether that's the case. Friendships, obviously very important because non-negotiable, um, sorry, a negotiable relationship uh, which can be broken and, and formed quite fluidly and is conditioned by unwritten rules of friendship. So if somebody has not understood those unwritten rules, that can be very difficult. But it's important to note that lots of children with developmental problems have problems with friendships. So language problems will make your friendships more tricky, particularly as you, as you, as you get older and particularly if you're trying to form new friendships. Um, and, but ADHD difficulties, behavioural inhibition difficulties, um, make friendships more difficult. Classically, the child will be very charming and make friends quite easily, but lose them because they're partly getting into trouble a lot, and children don't necessarily, necessarily like that, but also they're quite full on, um, and people tend to drift away. And finally, it's important to think about how the child exists within group settings. Obviously, the classroom is the classic one, and you will have some data about that, but if a child's got learning difficulties but is otherwise doing quite well developmentally, very often you get the pattern where the classroom is not good, but actually when they go to jiu-jitsu or when they go to have a family party or when they go to church or mosque, they're perfectly fine because they're not being academically stretched. And so that can be quite interesting. Conversely, of course, if the child is absolutely no good, not, not coping at all in a group setting, particularly if that's not on their agenda, then that is an indicator that there might be some social difficulties. Again, not specific to any particular diagnosis, but important nonetheless in knowing, okay, this is an area where the child needs, we, we need to do some work. So when I say behavioural inhibition, I'm effectively talking about indicators of ADHD. And actually, this is one of the only areas where there's such a close uh, mel melding between a particular developmental skill. It is a skill. It's a, a, the ability to inhibit your own behaviours, to inhibit your own impulses, but also to control your brain. Uh, the way I think about ADHD is as a sort of hungry brain that constantly needs stimulation. And it's the ability to, to, to control that that um, is lacking in ADHD. Um, uh, and also the sort of the degree of hunger. So this leads to difficulties with attention span. So it's important not just to think about attention span when you're doing homework, but also attention span when you're doing something that's fun or when you're doing a very simple everyday task. So a lot of children will have difficulties when they're asked to go and tie to their room. Some will refuse, that's not an indicator. But if they go willingly and then you find them two minutes later doing something else, that may be a problem with attention. And then there's the ability to sit, be still or quiet Obviously, we've already asked about meal times often, and we know about school times. But it's also, you know, things interesting things like going to the barbers or the hairdressers. Are they able to sit still? And how difficult is it for them to sit still in those contexts or on the bus? Just think about times in that child's life when they need to be still, need to be quiet, and whether they manage it. And then, of course, there's waiting. So they may wait, have to wait in a supermarket queue, or they may need to wait to talk when they are uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a group context. So think about those things, that those are the sort of core difficulties which you just need to adapt your questioning to the context of the child, to the age of the child and, and what the expectations are of the child. And then there's uh, motor and self-care skills. Now this is, really this is really interesting in that motor skills and self-care skills are often bundled in together and, and that's absolutely understandable, but self-care is t the ability to dress and wash and clean, uh, and, you know, pack your bags and like, organise yourself, uh, determined by so much more than your motor skills. They are, motor skills are necessary to do these things, but they're not sufficient. So a lot of kids will have poor self-care skills, but actually their motor skills are absolutely fine. Nonetheless, it is important to understand and know at this point. And often the, 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 the question is, okay, he finds it hard to get dressed. Is it because he literally can't get the trousers on or he gets them round, the wrong way around or he kind of, you know, gets really awkward and kind of fingers and thumbs? Or is it because he's too busy or he's angry or he doesn't want to go to school? So that's the question really in a way. Nonetheless, if you're thinking about motor skills, um, and I've sort of talked in my lecture on child development, why it's important that, that motor skills are part of uh, developmental assessment and why they're important in mental health services. There's top two areas really. One is the child's sort of everyday activities and they tend to be more gross motor kind of activities. So that will be going to the playground, riding a bike, playing football, or other sports are available. Um, just generally the sort of big movements, the big things that they do throughout their life. And then if you're thinking about finer work, 
obviously the fine work the fine work is important for uh, self care so brushing your teeth using cutlery lacing uh, tying shoelaces okay that's all important and that's motor skills but outside of that a lot of the fine motor skills come into play when you're looking at broadly school work obviously not always done at school so handwriting drawing uh, cutting things out that sort of thing becomes very important and again it's very important um, partly because it will give you an indication that there may be a kind of neurodevelopmental history uh, that's emerging but also actually having these difficulties really doesn't help you psych your psychosocial function and will improve and worsen your behavior and worsen your emotional state so this is important stuff even if it's not your area of expertise now I've put this stuff together because it just seems to cluster within a particular group. So this is children who are rigid. Now immediately when you think about somebody who's got a rigid cast of mind, you think about autism, but a lot of kids are rigid but don't have autism because the rigidity of autism, which is often um, comes out as an attitude, a negative attitude to change, difficulty with change, needing a lot of priming for any sort of transitions, is driven or the uh, insistence on sameness in rituals or watching the same movie over and over again and in increasingly in the sort of modern generation of watching the same YouTube video over and over again. Um, those are driven by anxiety broadly. They are driven by a fear of uncertainty, driven by um, kind of almost driven positively by the comfort of these rituals. I think that's why I put this, this um, picture up. This is a ritual um, conducted uh, every few years on, on, on the banks of the Ganges in Varanasi, and it's intensely comforting. And there's nothing, we kind of, this sort of ritual we're all for because it's socially mandated. But actually, in the same way that you get comfort from a religious rig ritual, if you're so inclined, so an autistic person will get comfort from their own rituals, and that's important. Nonetheless, not everyone who has rituals, not everyone who has a, a fear of change is autistic. Not everyone who's, rig who's rigid is autistic. An anxious person who's not autistic will also be rigid, and that's important. It's particularly important when you think about children with, say, developmental language problems or ADHD, who are rigid, and everyone sort of thinks, oh, are they also autistic? Actually, the point is that they're anxious, and we're very bad at picking up anxiety in, in those sorts of children who are beh often behaviourally very difficult, and we don't think of them as having emotional difficulties, but often they do, and I think it's really important to think about those. Broadly, when you're thinking about, once you're talk, thinking a little bit about anxiety, well, you obviously need to think about fears and phobias in a way that's probably very familiar to mental health professionals. But a lot of this, uh, partly because, um, the uh, sensory needs, the sensory modulation needs, which I talk about in my previous lecture, are very common in, in autistic spectrum disorders, but also because there seems to be, at some very deep level, which is kind of common to all of us, a connection between our emotional and our sensory selves. So if we think about it, if we are emotional, if we are feeling angry, we'll clench our fists. If we're feeling worried, we'll kind of wring our hands. So there's a real deep, and it does seem to be some neurological correlates for this and some sort of kind of brain connections that are very strong between sensory inputs and your emotional state. So I think, it, I think this fits for that reason, and partly also because when you have a sensory modulation difficulty, so you can't turn your senses up and down, everything can often feel too much. So even simple things like, like I'm wearing a collared shirt, some children can't cope with a collared shirt because it's constantly irritating them, they can't switch it off. Some children can't cope with uh, socks, with, with seams, or they can't cope with particular textures, or they can't cope with particular noises. And so those things are very important, partly because they reflect an underlying connection with anxiety, but also they're very anxiety provoking as a, and, and you can get into vicious cycles of um, negative behaviours, uh, which then cycle back and, and, and improve and, in, and increase the child's emotional agitation, which makes them more sensitive to sense. And so therefore you go round and round and round. So that's why I think this fits in here um, and is, I think, very important and to ask about. So then we move on to what you actually have to ask the child. I think it's really important to talk to children if you possibly can. With the older children, you can just start immediately, and I like doing that a lot because it makes them feel kind of special and, and at the centre of things. But also it gives you in useful information. Now I tend to make this a little bit structured, and I tend to answer, ask roughly the same questions all the time, partly because I want to know 
okay, what's a typical six-year-old say about his friends, for instance? And I've got a larger sample. I can kind of can judge these things better. But broadly, I ask what they like at school, what makes them happy at school, if there's anything that makes them annoyed or sad, um, and you know what they like doing. Um, and then obviously, obviously, if they don't mention friends, you can ask about their friends. I'll talk about friends in a minute. At home, ask the same questions. And so the reason for that is that home, you don't, the family don't feel like they're be, you're being inquisitive inappropriately about home and about anything that makes you sad at home, because of course that's really a safeguarding question and it's a sort of tricky, trickstery, trickstery way of getting that question in. Um, but actually just the, their impressions of home and, and school, which you don't have to take as, as in any way accurate, because very often they're not. Um, <laughs> but their, their opinion is really important nonetheless. And just to talk particularly about friends, I think it's really important, to, particularly for thinking about autistic spectrum disorder or social communication difficulties, social understanding difficulties, is to ask about the, the, what the child sees as a friend. What is it is they like about a friend? Because if it's, oh, he also likes Pokemon, that's kind of more instrumental. Whereas if it's, he's really funny and he's nice to me, that's more kind of uh, personal. That's more to do with a relationship. So it's, it's nuanced, but that's a really important question. So pay attention when you're talking to a child to what is said, how it is said, so you will pick up certain com uh, communicative um, features. So is the child mono you know, rather monosyllabic? Do they go off on one? Do they give you lots of information you don't need? Are they happy to talk? Are they shy? All those things are really important, but also what is not said. Um, and the, the, you know, very often you have to kind of keep the parent quiet and then at the end of the conversation you have the child saying, I'm going to talk to your mum now or your dad. And they'll go, oh, everything you said is nonsense. And you're like, yeah, okay, fine. But it's it, what the fact that they are not telling you about somebody in the house, they're not saying somebody lives there, is important. So then to skip on to do some direct assessment, I'm not going to describe in detail the direct assessment that we do in our, assess in our, in our clinic for two reasons. One is, um, I haven't got time, and also um, it doesn't massively matter. There is no perfect battery of uh, tests. The point of doing direct assessment of the child's developmental skills is to get an estimate of their cognitive level. And the reason you want to do that is that you want to adjust your behavioural and emotional expectations to their cognitive level. There's no good having the expectations of a nine-year-old if you have uh, the cognitive, cognitive skills of a six-year-old. You've then got to adjust yourselves not only to the fact that the child is six, but also that they are around children who are three years more advanced than them, and that will have an effect on their behaviour. So it is important to get that, but anything you can do, we, we, you know, anything you can do to try and get an estimate of that is, is absolutely valid, and there's lots of things out there. But it's also not only important to get an that, that kind of estimate, um, but also to, 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 know, to see what the child does when they're presented with difficult things or boring things. One of the things I use, the, the, the coloured progressive matrices, I, I value not only because of the information it gets, but also because they've got to do 36 consecutive puzzles. And particularly for the children with ADHD, that gets really dull. And the, their response to the dullness of it is diagnostically useful. In the same way, I use a vocabulary scale, um, not because it's the most brilliant language test in the world, but because it's fascinating how children <laughs> define different words and how they respond to the fact that they eventually can't understand the words because they've got too difficult. How they respond to that is really important. So I think it is important in some ways to have some attempt to work out test different parts of the child's cognitive skills, just so you know, okay, there's a bit of a spike here, and they're good at this and not so good at this, partly because you may pick up things like a language disorder, but also because, you're like, okay, he's just generally a bit spiky, and his performance really depends on the task. That may be a, a very soft marker for neurodevelopmental problems. And then, of course, all the time you are observing. There's an, I don't have any separate time for observation. I'm observing the communication. I'm observing how the child responds, how they relate to the to the adult. Um, you know, is there affection? Is there, how does the adult talk about the child? Not just factually, but in terms of the tone of the, how they're talking about it about them. And so some families will kind of be out of their way, kind. And, and positive about a child who's having very great difficulties. And that's lovely and also positive for the future, but other parents will sit down and immediately launch into a litany of how difficult this child is and how frustrating they find it. That is not only a, probably a little bit harmful to the child, diagnostically useless, 
and a waste of your time. So stop, put a stop to that and ask the questions that you need to ask because those are the, the diagnostically useful ones. But of course, it's also important to look at the child's behaviour. I make my assessments boring for the child, so I see what happens. See if they're wandering around, um, whether they press the alarm button. Every child who presses the alarm button in my clinic has subsequently got a diagnosis of ADHD, not because I immediately give them because they press the button, but it is an indicator that they are curious and impulsive. Physical examination. It's not compulsory to do a full phys physical examination in all children. It can be helpful. So if you have suspicion of genetic cause, it can be helpful. You may pick up some neurocutaneous markers, or you may just look at a child and think there's something unusual about this child's um, features, facial features, for instance, or they're a bit unusually short or unusually tall, high weight, low weight, and that may be a clue to underlying genetic things. It's useful to know, particularly if you have a child in a socially vulnerable family, what their general health is like. And I've put the word neglected, which is something that I'm caution about, as I've explained in my previous lecture, but yes, if you have a child who has poor dentition, whose clothes are dirty and who smells, that is an important um, clinical finding because it indicates difficulties with looking after this child. And then of course, if you are thinking about neurodevelopmental problems, you quite often find some neurological correlates, you'll often find some soft signs of co coordination difficulty particularly, and that can be a really important marker for uh, whether or not you have a neurodevelopmental uh, pattern here. So I often do very little but you always have to have a think about the child's physical examination. And then very often you don't have all the information you require to complete your assessment. Either you need more information just generally for what the child's needs are or you have a specific diagnostic question to answer and you need more information for that. And that's all fine, and there's various things that are helpful, I'm sure. Most people who are listening to this know about the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire. Because it's so familiar, we almost devalue it. It is very, very good, and it's, got very, it's actually got rather good um, correlates uh, and um, kind of validity when you're looking at, at ADHD particularly, particularly if you get several from, from uh, the same, on the same child. But obviously the, the, the most used uh, um, Questionnaire in ADHD is the Connors, but the SNAP is also worth mentioning because partly because it's free. However, the SNAP is very closely um, aligned to the particular criteria, and I do worry that the you have what I call kind of exasperation syndrome, where you have a questionnaire about a child that you're exasperated with, and you tick all along the right hand side because that's where the yes, he's the, all of these things and more, and please help me. Um, and that will lead to overdiagnosis if you're not very careful, whereas the Connors is more cleverly set up. The Arcads, I think, is a very useful, however, um, and uh, free to download um, questionnaire on anxiety and depression, which I use quite a lot to guide possible uh, mental health um, assessments. And can pick up things where you're, you, weren't, you weren't necessarily expecting them. Um, but the most important information gathering is talking to schools, talking to your colleagues in, uh, in the other sectors. So if you are sitting in a CAMS service and you know the child's been seen by occupational therapy, you have to talk to these people because they will have insights. And I think the other thing about these information gathering, and it frustrates me when people think about them as like a test or like an examination or a scan, they're just putting someone's opinion into an algorithm and producing a number. That is all they're doing. So if somebody's opinion is wrong, the number will be wrong. And, and as I've explained previously, you're triangulating it. This is just one of your points of information. They're just somebody's view. That said, the more the merrier in terms of diagnostic accuracy and, and just kind of understanding the child's needs. So how do you put it all together? Let's say you haven't got these questionnaires back yet, but you've, cause you, because you've, and you've completed your assessment, what you'll have is the referral form, which in our case has got a, a lot of information on it. Um, you've got what you see in front of you, you've got the family's information, you've probably got quite a lot. And what you've got is three things. You can have a go at a developmental profile, which may not be diagnostic at this point, but you know the child's strengths and difficulties because you've done the assessment. You know a bit about the psychosocial context, and you know a little bit about how other people respond to this child and what's been done. And you sort of put all those things together and say, well, look, can we put these things together to, to explain the behaviour, the functional difficulties or the, 
you know, that I put it under behaviour. What I don't mean by that is behavioural problems. I just mean how the child reacts, how the child um, behaves during their, during their life. And very often you can make sense of it using those three things. And therefore, what you can say is, OK, we'll work back from that. We know what the behaviour has been. We think we can explain it using these things. What can we change about these things? Do we need to look at the child's behavior, profile and, and maybe do a diagnosis and do some management about that? But as importantly, do we need to change the context? Do we need to support this family better? Do we need to think about the rest of the mental health, the mental health of the rest of the family? And also, do we need to change people's responses? So a child, for instance, who's being treated as naughty at school or badly brought up or you know, whatever, if you put a neurodevelopmental framing on it and say, look, he's not doing this stuff on purpose, he's finding this difficult, of course he needs to help, he needs to try, but you need to help him try, then that can, with the, the correct support and training, make a big difference. So those three elements are all important and we shouldn't just pick one of them out um, in order to, to work back and, and, and help, which is really what we're all about. So just to go back a little bit about diagnosis, because they are important. A lot of the diagnoses that we'll be making neurodevelopmentally are structurally quite similar. So they identify a type of brain. And each type of brain, so autistic spectrum disorders is a type of brain where there's a difficulty with understanding other people and more broadly a difficulty with making sense of the world in a way that is inductive. So get, making sort of educated guesses about what's going to happen, a subset of which is making educated guesses about how people are thinking and how people are, are feeling. That's autistic spectrum in a nutshell. As I've said, ADHD is more about a hungry brain, a brain which is very kind of insatiable, wants stimulation all the time, and is hard to control and keep, keep a handle on. Developmental coordination disorder is a brain where it's difficult to coordinate and accurately use sensory inputs and uh, pre-programmed um, motor uh, programs and motor sequences to, to do everyday tasks. And developmental language disorder is essentially your language ability, your language uh, development hasn't developed to the extent that you can um, communicate using words at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, a level that's expected for your age. The thing all of these things have in common is that they're all spectrum conditions. There is no cutoff, there's no kind of clear blue water between people with and without the condition. There is a range from typical to extreme in any of these kinds. And also they're all types of brain. They're not they're not sets of symptoms, although the criteria often treat them as sets of symptoms. They're kinds of brain that tend to present in certain ways. And they're sort of, and in all of them, it is, it's important to emphasize that these are not necessarily sort of broken or wrong. These are just different. Um, and I think that helps families an awful lot. And all of them require, essentially, to be along a spectrum as a reasonable amount, of quite, to, and often what I would say is to be far enough along a particular spectrum that it's causing them problems. And that seems to me to be the foundation of any of these kind of diagnoses. So there is the autistic spectrum, there'll be children who are gray, in a grey area, they've got not great social communication, but that's not their main problem. And so perhaps they shouldn't get a diagnosis because their main problem is something else. If it's causing them difficulty, it may be helpful to give them a diagnosis. Learning disability is different, and I've just pointed that out. So that is more based on the child's cognitive skills, and there is a criteria-based, you know, two standard deviations below the mean in terms of their cognitive skills overall and functional difficulties. So again, it's kind of a spectrum, but it's much more tied to a particular measure. Um, the point is, though, about these diagnostic assessments is that we do get quite hung up on particular elements. So we, you know, for autism, we get very keen about the ADOS and and so forth, so forth. But if you look at the criteria and you look at the guidance, there are no compulsory ev elements of any of these diagnoses. So I think it's important to go back and strip down what we're looking for. We're looking for where the child is along, whatever spectrum we're looking at, and whether their position on that spectrum is causing them problems, and therefore whether a diagnosis is going to help this child. Those are, that's the key question that we need to answer. We mustn't get distracted by all of this technical stuff. Nonetheless, there may be some further assessments required. Now, very much, this is very much in, in, the, in the region of my clinical uh, experience and to an extent my, my personal opinion. I like the ADOS, the ADOS, but the reason why I like the ADOS 
is, so the ADOS to explain is a uh, structured in, in, uh, interaction and observation sch uh, schedule which is used in the diagnosis of aut autistic spectrum disorder. It's good because uh, actually because it's quite an efficient and quick way of getting an awful lot of information about different sorts of interaction, different sorts of skills and deficits within the child. There are problems with it. Uh, in that it's only validated, the, the population in which it was validated were all male, so it's not actually that brilliant at diagnosing girls, another reason why girls have uh, difficulty with obtaining ADHD diagnoses. Um, and also I think it is perhaps a little old now, a little out of date, and probably needs re renewing. The ADI, is the, autistic di the Autism Diagnostic Interview, is a very lengthy interview which focuses very, very closely upon the features of autism. My objection to it is that if you have obvious autism, you don't need to spend three hours talking about it. If you have borderline autism, it may well be that actually the important thing is all of the other stuff around them, which the ADI is not good at. So for me, the ADI is not a good use of time. That's my personal view. You may want to get some more language or cognitive skills, cognitive assessment, if you have access to them. People get very um, worried, particularly in the NHS, about a lack of access to these formal assessments. But actually, we need to think is it actually going to help the child? Is it going to change what we do if we know that, let's say we've done a bit of a screen and we think there's a language problem. Fine, we'll do, do some language intervention. Is it going to actually change what we do, change what we do diagnostically if we know that they are two or three years behind and we've, you know, we've got finer details about that? Is it not more helpful just to, to, tr to try and help and put our resources into intervention and, and help? It's just raising the possibility that actually we can focus too much on uh, on our own kind of accuracy and, and doing all of these formal stuff. Occupational therapy, I actually refer a lot of people to, um, and actually really helpful service, often with people who, particularly for, for young children, young people who have self-care difficulties. And they don't need to necessarily just be to do with coordination, although occupational therapy know a lot about um, coordination. There's any kind of difficulty with self-care, um, uh, occupational therapy can be very, very helpful for. And the point is that they are not necessarily diagnostic, they want to improve function. So again, very much goes along with the, the kind of thrust of this talk. We do, as paediatricians, a lot of referrals for mental health assessments. I just want to flag that up, that this is a very important interrelationship, and I think it's very important that there is an ongoing relationship, both locally and at a national level, between paediatric services, and generally physical health services, and mental health services. And this is a real point, a very important point of context. I want to briefly touch on genetics. I don't actually do genetics uh, studies very often. Um, generally speaking, if we have specific indicators from physical examination, so a child is very tall, very short, has any unusual features about them, we may do genetics. And also we'll do genetics routinely on anyone who is in the learning disability range in terms of their cognitive skills. That in terms of my experience of CAMS clinics or mental health clinics generally is a fairly small number of children. So you may not be doing all, all that many genetic uh, referrals. So that's what I wanted to say. I've talked a lot about what to, what to ask and I've discussed a lot about the uh, um, assessment of uh, diagnosis and, and really whether that's something that you need to go into. I'm very happy to come back and talk about specific diagnoses and discuss things. Um, very happy to interact with this, this audience when eventually uh, this, when this goes up. But I wanted to make a few, quest a few closing points. The first is that developmental assessment, what fascinates me about it is that you have very simple questions. You're not asking complex and, and deep questions. You're asking about what they're like on the bus. You're asking about what it's like taking them to ASDA. But from that, you get this very complex picture, which doesn't always tell you exactly what you need to hear and let, until you've put it all together. So a lovely phrase a, a, a colleague once used is that diagnosis, in the context of autism, but it can be applied anywhere, diagnosis and assessment here is like doing a jigsaw of an elephant in that all of the pieces are gray and, and you can't see what it is until you've finished it. And I think that's true of this as well. And the point though, is that we can get very worked, we can get very wrapped up, and I've said this a few times, but I don't apologise for it. We can get very wrapped up in our own cleverness and our own assessments and this diagnosis or that diagnosis. But the point is to help. The point is to help families and children who are struggling to function better. And if we're not doing that, we're not we're wasting our time. So the focus on 
using any diagnosis, using any assessment as a tool to help these families is got to be our, always our focus. And so for that reason, I do use diagnosis and I, I, we want to talk about it, but it is a tool that we take up when we think it's going to help and then we put down again if it's not helping anymore. As I say, very happy to discuss any of the views expressed in this talk, uh, and uh, which are not the views of ACAM, but the views of me, um, and, uh, and to go on and talk about anything else that uh, people want to talk about. Thank you very much. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.